And welcome inside to Alex Scare Podcasting. I feel like I've got someone hugely important because what her great, 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 great grandmother did for the United States of America should not be lost. And Deborah Yates is making sure that the name Nancy Ward is not lost. Am I right, uh, Deborah? Thanks for joining me, Ms. Yates. Well, thanks for having me, Alex. It's a pleasure to be here. So you are a seventh-generation granddaughter of someone that orchestrated the purchase of Kentucky, was uh, very close to Daniel Boone and George Washington. Tell us about Mary Ward. Uh, Nancy Ward was... Sorry, uh, Nancy Ward, yes. That's fine. And um, she was known amongst the Cherokee as Nanyihi. She also had about 13 other names that she went by at some points in her life or titles, which were, you know, honorary titles um, that were bestowed upon her through her many years of service to the Cherokee people, as well as to what she did for the Americas. Um, she saved a lot of uh, colonialist lives and, you know, through her warnings from her son, you know, might have accidentally told her, was it on purpose? Nobody will ever know. And then she would use her discernment to, you know, make the judgment call. Do I allow the people in the village to know what's, what's coming at them? And more often than not, I believe she did decide that it, life was more important for everybody and uh, would warn the settlers and, you know, the people living in the towns and villages, and they would, you know, go hide or, you know, do whatever it was they had to do. She sounds a bit like Paul Revere, doesn't she? You know, maybe a little bit. You know, somebody said, you know, she, she reminds me of Joan of Arc and, you know, different, you know, historical, you know, people. And, you know, yeah, I think she's all those rolled into one. She's like, you know, a great Sunday with everything on it. And, um, you know, she did a lot of, of humane things and made a lot of speeches in her lifetime. She wrote letters to, you know, George Washington and passed, you know, and worked on treaties that, you know, had they not been signed and dealt with that George wouldn't, Washington wouldn't have been able to, to, you know, traverse the areas as freely as, as he did. Did, did she really protect them? It sounds like she did. I believe that she did. I absolutely believe that she protected him. I believe that she was, you know, very close to her creator. Um, the stories in our tribe were that um, there would be a woman born amongst the Wolf Clan that would rise and lead her people to greatness. And through those teachings and, you know, the, the lore of the stories, I believe that, you know, they recognized fairly early what a special person that um, Nanyihi was. And um, she was literally trained to to become the woman that, that she was. She was offered to, um, because she was born to a single woman, uh, not that she was not, you know, uh, illegitimate, so to speak, but her father had died, before, you know, right before her birth. And the custom would have been to have offered that child um, to someone that probably could have taken care of it better than you could have. And there was a lady named um, uh, Lucy Ward who came from England um, after Nanyahi's uncle, Okanastoa, had been to Europe on a ship called the Fox. And um, she ended up falling in love with Okanastoa and coming to the America. She was actually a lady in waiting to, I believe it was King George II's wife. It was either the second or the third. I'm pretty sure at that juncture it would have been King George II. So there's a rich history. You know, a lot of it, you know, could be fables, could be, you know, but most stories and fables and legends and things are, are based on facts. So. I believe that's what happened. Well, Deborah Yates, I'm talking to. She's talking about her, what seventh generation grand grandmother, um, Nancy Ward, and she's a Native American, Nancy. So, a lot of people these days want to know their ancestry, and I can't imagine you're one of them. I mean, you want to go so back. I can't imagine you want to know your family history, right? So, uh, how did you find out about this connection? Well, actually, my grandfather. Um called her Nani, Nani he, um, more than he did Nancy Ward. 
Um, I knew about her from probably about 12 is when I found out we were Native American. And um, it was just not talked about. It was basically kept secret for, you know, decades, many decades because of the prejudice and so on and so forth. And when my grandfather moved to Ohio, he decided he was moving there as a white man and um, to have all the advantages that, you know, everybody else got to enjoy that a lot of Native American people didn't feel they were free to enjoy. So um, when he came up there in the uh, early 40s, my grandpa was a white man. So he didn't talk about it and the children... Uh, were um, forbidden also to speak of it. And when my mother finally broke down and told me that I was Native American, um, she told me not to tell anybody either. I defied that, like, immediately. Mm -hmm. I went straight to school the next day and told everybody I was Cherokee Indian. And, um, you know, which explained a lot to me that I think maybe I didn't have a full understanding of where you know, my family came from. And then I have found out since that the seventh grade, uh, not seventh great grandfather, but my second great grandfather was also a Mayflower descendant. So wow. it, it, it has opened up a, uh, a whole different can of worms, so to speak. So, um, you know, I had relatives that were also part of, you know, the Revolutionary War front that came from Scotland and started a, a foundry up there that made most of the weapons that, that were used by the Americans in, in that war. So, uh, you know, if you clom all that together, I just feel so deeply connected to America. It's crazy. But, um, yeah, it's find out who you are. You know, it doesn't matter. You know, Belle Starr is part of my background, you know, as an auntie. And um, she was kind of a legendary lady herself. Uh, and, and another descendant was um, Will, Will Rogers, was wow. a Nancy Ward descendant. So, you know, we're, we're steep in, um, you know, uh, in this country. You know, our, 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 this is our, this is our place. And, um you know, and has been for a really long time. So it's, it's cool. Know your, know your history, know, sure. know your phone, find out who your people were. Nancy, let's talk about, uh, Nani. Why, why did you want to write the book now? What, what's the, uh, what's the reasoning behind now when you've known about this for so many years? Well, I had the time for stars, you know, life happens and, uh, I I never believed that, you know, I didn't think about writing a book, you know, I, I didn't ever, you know, consider myself a person that would ever, you know, write a book. It was, I'm an accidental author. And if it hadn't been for me just wanting to write down, you know, the stories that my grandfather had told me and his brothers and sisters had told me, there would be no this book. Mm. And it was just, I was doing it for my family. And the lady that helped me, you know, trans, you know, pose it from, you know, uh, written on a notebook paper to, you know, the computer, um, just told me oh, that you've got to, the world needs to read this book. I, this can't just be for your family. So after thinking on it a while, I thought, well, I, I don't have anything to do. I just got a divorce and was moved to Florida and I was really bored. So it just became a wonderful, beautiful adventure that, you know, took a couple years of research and driving around and, you know, living in Tennessee, you know, off and on for, you know, probably a total of two and a half months. And, um, you know, just hanging out with the local folks and getting their ideas about, you know, what went on down there at that grave site and, you know, where Nancy's old home was, which was a woman killer Ford after her village was burnt to the ground. Hmm. Um, you know, she had to go somewhere. So, um, you know, it just became a wonderful, wonderful adventure. And I, you know, I'm blessed that, you know, the, the creator chose me to tell this part of the story and, you know, it's a God thing. It was a, totally a God thing. I believe that with all my heart. Well, I think it comes at a time. By the way, the book is called Women, Woman of Many Names by Deborah S. Yates. You can find it online, I'm sure, at Amazon and, and wherever else. Do you have a website, Deborah? 
Um, there is one being created as we speak. Um, it's not fully prepared yet, but um, if you, you know, research woman of many names, it'll it'll pop up a website and on Facebook there is a, a page dedicated to there. Just you know, search woman of many names and you'll be able to, you know, see events that I've done and plan to do in the future and, you know, different interviews. Uh, Tell me about, uh, see, the timing of this to me is very relevant because we're seeing issues in the reservations. We've seen girls gone missing. We've seen situations and crises. So do you hope that this hits the different tribes in America right now dealing with a lot of trauma? Well, I believe that, um, you know, everything happens for, you know, a purpose and a reason. You know, we have, as a people, been, you know, not looked at in a very positive light for, you know, hundreds of years. Um, This year is the 200th anniversary of Nanihi's uh, passing. And, um, you know, we plan to do a special dedication, rededication uh, memorial at the uh, grave site in Benton, Tennessee. And, you know, who knows what the creator had in mind when he mm-hmm. just opened all this up. My cousin, uh, Becky Hobbs, she's a famous country music legend, has written a play um, called Nanihi. And it's a uh, beautiful musical about our grandmother and and the, her rich history from birth to death. And, you know, we started our projects at about the same time, didn't know each other at that time, only through our works have we, you know, gotten to know each other and become friends. And, you know, there just has to be a reason mm. that, you know, God has, you know, to almost 200 years after this woman's death, you know, bring forth the legends and the stories again. So I'm hoping that it makes a difference that, that all tribes will, you know, take a second look at Nancy Ward and, you know, even amongst our own, you know, I keep people that, you know, the Eastern band, the Western band, the Ketua, the Kitawa, whichever you choose to call that, Mm. um, We'll take a second look at Nancy Ward and, you know, understand her place in history. And at least she has a place in history. At least she did something. And, um, you know, and people talked about it. And um, even back then, you know, there was a letter that she wrote to President, you know, Washington that somehow or another wound its way to Thomas Jefferson. So, you know, you have to understand that that didn't happen by accident you know somebody had to have handed from one president to another sure. letter written by a, a Cherokee woman that um you know helped these guys and was able to you know like I said she sold you know Kentucky to Daniel Boone and the Transylvania company you know that was how did she do that uh, can you can you detail that for a, l- a little bit before they delve into sure. the book the um You know, the Transylvania Company was going and acquiring lands, you know, well before the Revolutionary War and uh, before, you know, it was thought of that America would become an independent country. And um, he worked for they hired him because they knew that he had, you know, interfaced with a lot of uh, American Indians and in his travelings. And the, the Cherokee called him wild wide mouth. And the reason they called him White Mouth was because not because he had necessarily a big mouth, but because he would walk through those hills singing and bellowing and talking at the top of his lungs. <laughs> and, um, you know, that um, kind of signified to the, you know, the Indians that were probably stalking him. That man is flat crazy. We leave him alone because they didn't mess with people that were touched in the head. They just kind of let them do their thing. So I know they thought he was touched. And, um, you know, but through the years, you know, I I believe they met each other several times. And um, because there is, you know, we know Nancy did a lot of traveling. Nanya, he was, um, you know, she was a negotiator. And um, they wanted to acquire the state of Kentucky. 
we knew we couldn't hold that. That was our summer hunting grounds. We knew as the as more people were coming to the Americas and more people being born here that we were not going to be able to hold lands that far away. And so she sold them. I mean, it was a coup, you know, wow. <laughs> it was just a coup. Uh-huh. So anyways, it, it uh, you know, was, you know, I met some Boones and they said, you know about our grandparents, right? And I said, wow. yeah. I, I know about our grandparents. Yes, I do. But it's 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 beautiful. I'm sure we all hold things, you know, to our hearts that, you know, we believe um, in seriously. And I'm glad that, um, you know, that, you know, people have taken an interest in, in the works that I've done. And um, hopefully here real soon, I'll be on to the next chapter and get myself back up there to uh, Thomas Jefferson's uh, library and and you know really start searching through there to find out what's more to be discovered about Nancy. So you are Native American and some you know in the minority community don't do not believe in the founding fathers. So my question to you is do you hold that belief in the founding fathers and and does being an American change that like how are you able to carry on that legacy as well? Well, you know, that's an, a, probably a good question and um, one that I would really like to give some thought to. But what I'm thinking is we can't deny where we all came from. And our founding fathers were in, you know, several hundred years ago, were able to sit down and come up with a plan that would lead this country to govern itself for hundreds of years. So they were very intelligent men. And, you know, back then things were different. I mean, slavery didn't start in America and slavery hasn't ended in America. Not saying that there's still slavery here. There may be some forms of it, you know, through sex trafficking and and different things like that, you know, which are illegal in this country and have been for a very, very long time. Slavery started, you know, probably at the beginning of time. So, you know, I'm not going to sit in judgment on those men for what they did and how they did it. I believe in my heart that they were good men and that they wanted a resolve. Actually, there are some writings where George Washington wanted to address that and nobody would go along with it, even though he did have slaves. A lot of those slaves were inherited for those men. Um, that came, you know, they were passed down through the family. So what do you do with that? And a lot of people didn't know, will they be able to take care of themselves on their own? There's so many things that, you know, get in, into that. And I had the pleasure, the absolute honor of meeting a Hemings. Um, Sally Hemings was his, I believe, seventh or eighth great grandmother. And Thomas Jefferson was his grandfather. Hmm. And we were discussing this very thing that was at a, you know, at an intimate dinner party. And, you know, I had just cooked probably 10 courses for everybody. And through our discussions of my book, it, you know, he told me who he was and, you know, and he was, you know, visibly upset. And I looked at him and I said, I'm going to say something to you, honey. If there was no Thomas Jefferson, there'd be no you. Mm. How do you deny that, sir? How do you deny that? Your sisters wouldn't have been, your mommy wouldn't have been here. You know, let's look at it from that point of view. We both ended up in tears. And he says, you have given me a new perspective. And I'm crying now. I want to cry on who I am. I said, be proud of who you are. She was an amazing, wonderful woman. And he was an amazing man. Mm. And they beget you. And he's just, you know, we're both just, and his girlfriend standing there, you know, rubbing his shoulder and, you know, saying, honey, this is what I've been telling you. This is the same thing I've been telling you. And, you know, as I sit here covered in goosebumps, that was a, a moment in my life I will never forget. Just to know you talked to a relative of Thomas Jefferson, that's making my hair stand still, too. And, and, and tell him to be proud of who he was. Like, I'm proud of who I am. You know, if it wasn't for these people, there'd be no us. 
you know, and like I said, slavery didn't start here. It started thousands and thousands of years ago. So long ago, we don't even understand, you know, the premise of, of what that could have been like and what that looked like. I mean, you know, look at the Jewish people that have endured so much, mm. so much. And, you know, and they're still hated on today. For everybody that's somebody different doesn't understand, even though we're so cultured now. And people still don't understand. Wow. You know, no, you're who right. a Native American is, who, who a Jewish person is, uh, who a black person is. You know, it, you could say that about every country that, around the globe. And, I'm, you know, where we need to get is we go, oh, okay, we're all cool people, okay? We all have things to offer. We all have, have ideas that are worth sharing. And we need to become one fire as a mm. world. I don't see it happening anytime soon. I hoped I would see that in my lifetime. I'm 64 years old. Mm. I prayed when I was young to see that. that um, Deborah, where are you from, all, by the way? I am. I was born in Ohio and mostly raised in the Ohio. And right now, where are we talking to you from? I am in Bonita Springs, Florida. Well, that is a Florida is a very interesting state right now with all the stuff going on. But but besides that, um, COVID stuff and whatnot. But besides that, uh, how did Nanahi transcend the boundary? I, I don't know if I've asked you that yet. I think she was able to do that because number one, she was smart and she had been trained by her uncles who were, who were chiefs and of, you know, of her, you know, area, the Chota area, her grandfather, Matoy was, you know, uh, considered the, the king of, the, of America. And well, King George II said that, but, uh, um, you know, because he had to work, with something so um he matoy sent a um a hat to to king george the second and it was called the crown of tenacity and somewhere it still must be over there um in england but you know you know our ties are so so bound up with our european ancestry and you know because you know most everybody descends from there <laughs> right right so uh you know one providence one area one country or multiple countries you know and it, it is a beautiful thing you know and people need to get over themselves mm. we cannot change what happened 200 300 500 2000 years ago we can't change it but we sure can do better going forward and just accept each other for the beautiful blend of mutts we've all become <laughs> you know because we are we're mostly mutts now you know you know you get your pie chart from you know ancestry dna after you know you give them your sample of spit and um they go about figuring out where all your spit came from right and you know there's you know multiple uh, slices of pie on that chart and there's very few that say 100 percent this or 100 percent that if you are one of those you are you know uh -huh. in my mind your royalty of some sort you know uh <laughs> they've been able to maintain 100 percent authenticity of where your ancestors came from that's just about unheard of so you know i i just i you know all we can do is pray that things change and did you, know. you uh did you did you manage it are you managing a career while you're writing this intensive book i mean i can't imagine the research you've gone into no. with this I was completely retired. Um, I had worked in Ohio as a landscape design artist for close to two decades. I had a lot of very important um, people that I worked for that, you know, afforded me a beautiful living and um, taking care of their estates and so on and so forth and their grounds. And when I left Ohio, I was so broken inside that I had to find purpose and um, writing about Nancy gave me the purpose that I needed to to build a life again, to put one back together and, and go on again. That is, uh, it, it's great that Nanahi and, and, and Nancy, if you will, uh, gave you that hope again. But I've got to ask you this to pretty much wrap it up. I'm a sports guy and I see the attacks on all these teams and it's, 
very uh it's very hard to think that getting rid of a name could actually help the current day Native Americans. And maybe I'm wrong on that, but I feel like the way you're writing and it w- wouldn't it be more of an encouragement to write about these people, uh, about these Native American heroes and heroines than to get rid of names. Uh, it just seems pointless. W- would you agree or is there merit to getting rid of these sports names? You know, I, I have mixed feelings on, on all of that. I, I personally, to me, I think that that some of the strongest people on earth are are on those teams that you know held you know the Cleveland Indians, you know, so on and so forth, and you know they're they're talented sports people, and they named them after strong, you know, legendary tribes and so on and so forth you know now we're going to have some really unusual names you know i mean Mm -hmm. it didn't offend me at all but you know who am i i'm 60 some years old and i come from a different mindset Mm -hmm. than a lot of these you know the young people that are seem to be more upset about those things than others um you know and they're more displaced from that time than than we are but I don't understand it. I, I don't. I looks like it's all going to happen. They're destroying statues of, you know, northern people and southern people. I had, you know, people that fought in the uh, Civil War. My family were, you know, in the north and, um, you know, laid down their lives setting, you know, people free. That's mm-hmm. what it was for. You know, now they're trying to change their minds and, oh, no, you know, always, oh, you know, another hundred years since then. But now you think you know better what they were doing a hundred and some years ago, mm. 140 years ago. No, I don't think so. <laughs> um, you know, you're you can't have a better idea than what they did in like 19 in 1870 or 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 1900 of what they were trying to accomplish when that war happens between the North and the South, you know, they just can't. And, um, you know, if they want to say they do well, then more power to them, but they're lying to everybody. It's what they're doing. Mm. They're lying. And that's my personal belief. Deborah, this slavery wrong. Of course, honey, it, it was wrong on every single level that there is. Deborah, thank you for this insightful, uh, conversation. I'd love to have you back. As the book goes, and I know that Ilya Kazan regretted not making a movie. So, if this book yeah. ever does lead to a movie, I'll, I'll be in. I'll be taking a look and, and uh, have you back and see what steps are next in the next chapter, as you say. That would be be a wonderful end. To all this <laughs> would be a wonderful one. Well, Deborah S. Yates. Do you, so are you online at all? Do you have a Twitter or not really? No, I really don't Twitter. I don't Instagram. I don't Twitter. I'm. I'm old. I was just, you know, that stuff just, yeah, no. I will only do that if I'm made to. <laughs> Understood. Well, Deborah Yates, seventh, I believe, seventh generation granddaughter, a great granddaughter of uh, of Nanahi, uh, Nancy, a woman of Mary, many names, Nancy Ward. My goodness, I love this conversation. Please do come Thank back. You. I will. Thanks a lot, Alex, and you have a a safe night. And on to know, you know, the Chiefs are on this weekend. We'll see what they do. And I'll be back Monday with some sports as well on Alex Garrett Podcasting. We'll talk to you soon.